Okay. Well, in this video, we're going to take a look at the cloner, kind of the one of the main, most important MoGraph objects we have. Definitely up there with, say, MoText, uh, maybe even the Matrix object for more advanced users. But um, when I think of MoGraph, I really think of the cloner, and that's what we're going to be diving into today. So let's get started. You'll see I already have some elements created for us to take a look at, uh, you know, a lot of the different options we have. Uh, most of these are pretty simple. Uh, we have just a hexagon or inside um, spline and an extrude a cube, a sphere, uh, one cube that has a bend deformer on it where it's um, the strength has been set to 180 degrees and another that it's been set to zero. Lastly, a can that I grabbed from the asset browser um, and a little sphere we'll use as a droplet. So there's my cloner all set and ready to go. Um, and ultimately, we're not gonna spend too much time talking about the effectors tab. Uh, the effectors tab is just like the effectors tab in the Mo text, in the fracture, Voronoi fracture, or really any other MoGraph object. So if you're interested in those, um, check out some of my other videos uh, that will show you how to you know, apply effectors as well as use effectors. And I'm thinking about doing a video for the plain effector, maybe even the random effector uh, here in the, the near future. So with the cloner, the first thing I wanna point out is that it is a generator like our other MoGraph objects. It is green uh, and therefore usually needs a child in order to create geometry. Uh, and that's exactly what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna start by taking my first cube here dropping it into the cloner. And what you'll see, oops, if I just move this up, is we end up with a grid of cubes. Now, aside from the effectors tab, the object tab is really where we'll be spending the majority of the time. Um, we do have different modes here. We'll be taking a look at several of these, actually all of them. Um, we do have different options for how these clones are created, as well as some other things. The one thing I want to point out here in the grid pattern is that each mode is going to have different options for how these clones get created as well as spaced out. So for my grid, I can choose whether to have that grid on the X, Y, and Z axes, how many I want, whether I want the size uh, to be calculated per step. Um, so that's for each cube, you know, I'm going to space it 200 centimeters, which works out perfectly since this cube is 200 centimeters. Um, or if I just want to do an, the endpoint, which will calculate the total size. Um, I personally think per step works a little bit better because uh, once you have it sized to uh, the geometry that you've made a child, um, it makes it much easier to just add more. So I could make the count larger on the X, larger on the Z. And what do you know? I have a grid of cubes. Now, uh, currently the form is set to cubic. Um, and you can have other options depending on which you choose. Now for um, sphere, oh, where'd that one go? Um, you know, cylinders working pretty well. Object, you can drag in an object there and it will try to fill it up. All right, sphere on the other hand, I think we're gonna have to add more on the Y axis and that's starting to help. Oops, I also think um, the spacing here is also going to be something that's important as we're seeing. Although it almost looks like a, a person's face with the way that's sticking out there. So that's the sphere. I primarily use this with cubic, though I could see object uh, also being helpful if you're trying to uh, perhaps fill something up a little bit. So that's really kind of the main, main points of this grid section. Um, while here, I also want to take a look um, at uh, the random uh, mode here, okay? So if I switch this to random, what it's gonna wanna do is randomly create the objects that are a child of this. Now, since I only have a single object, it really doesn't make much of a difference. But if I put my sphere in there, now you can see how it is randomly distributing, uh, distributing or creating those uh, clones. If this was set back to iterate, you can see it's just going um, pretty much down the list here, right? Sphere, cube, sphere, cube, over and over again. So very kind of repetitive problem or um, pattern. If I switch this to random, you can see that we get, uh, you know, a very good combination of either the sphere or the cube, and you can 
continue to randomize it until you find one you like using the seed value here. Now, you may be wondering about the blend option, and I will come back to that in just a little bit. Um, because before um, I do that, uh, I also want to take a look at the linear option. Now, linear is going to create things in a straight line, and I'm actually just going to create uh, a single cube here. Now, each of these different modes are going to have different settings for how uh, your clones will be created or spaced out. Uh, so for these, I'm going to need to bump up the spacing a little bit. Okay, can move this back down a little. Uh, and I can adjust the count. Right, let's actually switch this back to iterate as well. So the count, the offset, so I can have it start at a different clone position. So at zero, it's going to start at the beginning. One, it's going to start at the clone one. Clone two, clone three. Uh, I will say for more advanced things, um, sometimes Expresso, uh, perhaps even some type of materials, um, it is important to know that the clone numbering starts at zero and not one. Okay, spacing here, uh, X, Y, and Z position. Okay, so while it's currently a straight line, you can get it to be at a different angle. All right, you can also adjust the scale. So each one is being scaled or will be 92% as wide as the previous one on the x-axis, and then rotation. So you can create some really kind of interesting shapes here, some very abstract looking shapes, geometry, uh, and other cool things for you know animations uh, and other, other purposes. Okay, so um, let's, ta uh, now that we've talked about linear, let's talk about the blend mode a little bit. I'm gonna just kind of reset, reset, some of these values back to their original values, which you can do uh, by right clicking on um, some of these arrows. We'll set them to their original value or sometimes just zero amount. So I'm gonna create just a number of different cubes here. And instead of using this default cube, uh, I'm gonna use my cube that have the bends on them. Uh, now it's important when it comes to using the blend um, uh, option here that the objects were created the exact same way or that they started from the exact same object because these have to have the same deformers um, and more importantly the same polygon count they have to be uh, the vertices the points have to be numbered the same as well so really you're taking two of the exact same object where one has been changed either by a deformer or pushing and pulling points. You can't use extrudes or welds or insets or other tools like that on those objects. Um, so uh, you almost have to think of it um, like uh, it, one object that's just been changed. It's still the same object, but like I said, we've pushed and pulled the points. Maybe it's been sculpted. Maybe it has a deformer applied to it. Now, as you'll see, when these objects are the same, with the, uh, the clones option here set to blend, you can see it's going from my straight cube and each one is just rotating a little bit more um, until it reaches uh, this last one that has been rotated 180 degrees. So really kind of interesting transition or blend between these. Uh, now, what you may want to do with this uh, is animate between them. And this does require an effector um, and it can be a little bit tricky, but uh, I'll start with a plane. Okay, now my cloner was selected when I created that plane effector. That's why it got applied in my effectors tab here. I can go to the plane. What I want to do is uncheck position because I don't want to modify the position here. What I want to do is instead modify the clone. So I can set this to 100%. You can see set to zero. They all have their different... Um, you know, blend amounts, when I set this to 100, they have all, they're uh, the same now. And I can use a field to control this. So I'm gonna rotate this field so that it's going vertical. All right, oops, there we go. I could have also just used the different direction here, probably would have been smarter. But now you can see as I move this through, it's getting the blend applied to each of them. So that's really how you would utilize uh, something like this, where you have two objects that are slightly different. Um, that's only one way 
you can kind of work with two objects like this, blending between them. Um, it's also another very common term for something like this is called morphing. It's very popular with character animations, facial expressions, that type of thing. Um, I could maybe do a basic video on that at some point since they are pretty easy uh, to at least once again kind of show the, the basics of. But I'm going to get rid of that plane effector uh, and I'm done with our cubes. We've taken a look at the blend mode here. So I can set that back to iterate because now what we're going to do is throw our hexagon in here to take a look at the honeycomb option. Now, I think it's really nice that uh, Maxon Cinema 40 finally got the default shapes to fit in here well, so you don't have to adjust the spacing. So you can see just how throwing in an inside spline in an extrude. Um, I also added a little bit of a bevel to this. Uh, fits perfectly in our cloner and allows us to create a really interesting background uh, without a whole lot of work here. All right. Um, once again, different settings for kind of the way uh, these are spaced, or in this case, more offset. Um, so you can adjust the offset here. Once again, it's depending, it's working for the shape I have, uh, I've already created, but if yours is different, you can adjust the offset. You can also adjust the count if you want more or less. Once again, you have an option for per step or endpoint. Um, I recommend setting it to per step because once you get the spacing correctly once, you can create as many of these as you want. Whereas if I do endpoint and say I want this uh, you know, to be wider, uh, the spacing gets you know, changed in between each of these individually. And so if I add another one, it can be really hard to get things to line up perfectly without overlapping. So um, that's why I like uh, per step. Like the grid, we also have different forms we can use, uh, which can be a nice way to get different uh, shapes as well. All right. Um, another property or option I like to point out is this uh, reset coordinates. Um, and it's not may not be immediately apparent what happens, but uh, with when you drop an object into a cloner, by default, uh, the center of the cloner is where it gets created from. Okay, so notice how the middle of my cloner um, object is where the cloner is based off of, which which makes sense. But you know things go out from there. Uh, however, my extrude my n-gon is off to the side here. And if we just move this a little bit more so we can kind of see what's happening. All right, doesn't really matter where this shape is. It matters where the cloner is. The problem sometimes is that we've often positioned um, the geometry we've, geometry we've created closer to where we may want the cloner to be. Uh, and so you can uncheck reset coordinates. And what it will do is center the cloner on where that object, um, the child was originally created, or at least the first one. All right. So the only other mode here, I shouldn't say that we have two left. Uh, we do have radial. So if you want to create something circular, you can absolutely do this. All right. Notice we have a count, we have a radius. All right. And the plane. Now this can be a little bit tricky as well, because notice how even with this radius set to zero, I still have this circle. Um, honestly, that's where the fit, uh, reset coordinates does uh, be a or can be a little bit problematic. So uh, if, if you are using the radial option, I would absolutely keep that turned on. You can see now how the radius um, is working quite a bit better uh, once I have that turned on. Okay, start angle, end angle, all pretty straightforward offset which doesn't really um, do anything um, because the start angle and end angle are the same. Now you can see how I can work with that. Uh, now the one thing that you're not gonna see in here is what happens when I put a spline in a cloner. Uh, I do have a video where I kind of already talk about that. So um, if you check out my video on the tracer, uh, you'll see how uh, you can work with a spline inside a cloner, uh, and create some interesting animations, and if you want to use the tracer object. Now, um, that just leaves us with our object option, which allows us to create clones on another piece of geometry. I'm going to delete my extrude out of there. 
place my little sphere, my little droplet, my little condensation thing inside of it. Uh, and now I need to tell the cloner what object I want to clone onto. In this case, it's the can, but the problem is uh, I don't really want to clone onto a null. I want to uh, clone onto the geometry. So I'll take that geometry. Oops. Make sure I have my cloner selected. Click and drag it in here. And now you can see we have our spheres being cloned onto our can. So it's looking pretty good. Uh, you do have the option to align the clone. Not really going to be helpful or make a difference with um, our can or um, our spheres here since you know they'll look pretty much the same wherever. Okay, um, you do have the ability to choose what direction you want up as well as how you want these distributed on your object. So whether you want them to put be put on the different points, edges, um, polygons, surface, or even volume. Once again, if you're trying to fill something up, um, at least in this case, surface is what I would like to see. You can also constrain where these um, spheres are going or whatever you know objects you have inside your cloner onto a selection of polygons so if I only wanted the droplets to be around you know this area here all I have to do is make a selection of polygons save that selection of polygons or store that selection uh, and now if I go and name it we'll call it front I can use that selection right here and now the only place we'll see those spheres is where I had selected. So that can also be uh, really kind of handy. Um, definitely used that before. Uh, lastly, skit or seed to randomize where these are going and count. All right, so obviously we're going to need more. Now really for something like this can, I would want to probably have a few different shapes here, not just spheres. I'm probably also going to use a random effector to change the size of these to make things um, a little bit more uh, natural and organic looking so that each thing isn't the exact same size. Now that just leaves one last kind of part of this I wanted to talk about, uh, and that is the instance mode here. Now, if you're only creating a few clones, then you can probably keep uh, your instance mode here set to instance. However, if you have a crap ton of clones, or if the clones you have are very high polygon, Render instance will make Cinema 4D's life or whatever renderer you're using's life um, a lot easier since it will only see this piece of geometry once come render time. That can screw up certain effectors. Uh, I've ran into it most often, often with the random effector, um, but it's definitely worth looking into because it can improve your performance um, in your perspective view uh, as well as when rendering. Um, if you had a lot of high polygon objects, Multi-instance can work as well um, because you can control how these objects are being displayed in the viewport, kind of taking that control of your performance um, a little bit further. So that is going to do it for this video. I appreciate everybody watching. Uh, let me know if there's anything else you would like to see me cover and take care.